Hello, I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge and our intern, Pastor Kevin Anderson, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. This week, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, 17 to 31, and uh, we have been following this Gospel ever since we ended the Bread of Life in chapter John, and we picked up Mark Gospel. Um, in chapter 8, and now we're moving on through chapter 10. And like I've mentioned a couple of weeks ago in a message, Mark 8, 9, and 10 are big turning points in this gospel. We see Jesus having just explained in Mark 8 what will happen to him. He explains it again in Mark chapter 9 of what will happen to him. We continually see the disciples not quite understanding it. And in the midst of all of this, we see lots of pointed lessons that Jesus is teaching of what it means to follow him. So let's take a look at our reading today. Mark 10, 17 to 31. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. It's easy to get very focused and miss the point, just like the rich man did. And so as we look at the rich man, we can see that he kind of misses the point. He, he's not quite understanding what it means to follow the Ten Commandments. A rich man approaches Jesus with considerable reverence, and he came to the right person and asked the right question. What do we have to do to inherit eternal life? The expression inherit eternal life even displays an awareness that eternal life was what God of Israel promises. To want what God wants is surely the way to go. But Jesus' reply is kind of abrupt. Jesus makes God, God, God alone. Jesus puts God first, in fact, echoing the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and you shall love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Effectively, Jesus is also drawing the man's attention to the first half of the Decalogue before citing the second half in his reply. So Jesus continues on with the keeping of the commandments, and Jesus' direct answer to the man's question comes in 10, 19 to 20, as he reminds him of the Ten Commandments. The story might have ended there except for Jesus' comment spoils the nice scene. Obviously, Jesus did not understand love as implying avoidance of issues, as too frequently happen. Out of love, he challenges the man. One thing is missing. Many find what is missing in what follows, and this must surely be true. But how are these words to be understood? How do we gain eternal life? Is Jesus saying that to gain eternal life, the man must now do three things, keep the commandments, sell his goods, re giving the proceeds to the poor, and thirdly, follow Jesus? If that were so, then Jesus is being rather unfair, telling him that the way was to keep the commandments. 
it would still imply something is missing from Jesus' answer. Was Jesus playing games with the man, setting up salvation by works only to knock it down? Hardly. Rather, Jesus' challenge to the man to sell possessions, give to the poor and follow him, was a way of exposing a flaw in the man's keeping of the commandment. Admirable as the man's effort had been, he had missed the point of the commandments. Jesus' challenge exposed what was missing, a sense of compassion for the poor. The man needed to understand, follow the commandments the way they are truly to be understood, the way Jesus interpreted them, not as a series of commands to be obeyed or boxes to be ticked. He then needed to follow Jesus, not as an alternative to the commandments, but as the way of understanding them and the scripture. Sadly, it is possible to go through life never doing anything wrong and never doing anything good or generous. Following Jesus means engaging the tradition and engaging life in a way that makes a difference. So at the heart of this passage are a number of fundamental issues. How we understand scripture, how life looks when we have eternal life, and what devotion to Jesus means. Remember, for all, the tradition of Israel and its hope has at its heart good news for the poor, with or without possessions. When people who want to revere Jesus are not good news for the poor, one thing is missing, one very big thing. The remainder of today's passage contains sayings now attached to the antidote, which reflect further on wealth and especially on the plight of the disciples. Mark 10, 23 to 25 has the famous camel saying, Riches so easily blind people to the vision of the kingdom and make them deaf to the cry of the poor. And there is a challenge. Our wealth brings to us a challenge. Mark 10, 26 to 27 can reflect a profound realization. The rich poor divide is nothing short of overwhelming, so much so that we often find ways of denying it and explaining it away. And so maybe a question for all of us is how much is enough? And have we ever denied it and explained our money away? Peter then asked this question. Peter is realistic. What about those of us who have abandoned everything? It is not difficult to imagine that there would have been many first century Peters asking this question, and we would also have the answer with which they comforted themselves. A new family, though with affliction thrown in, an eternal life in the age to come, an echo of the rich man's original question. I hope those Peters really did their Christian, did find their Christian colleagues and family as positive as that. But what about us? Is it out of place to have these very human concerns tagged to the end of this passage? It comes back again to the impossible, and that is often our fear. Fear suppressed blinds, and when we cannot see ourselves, we will often have as much difficulty also really seeing others. With God, it really is possible to face reality. Jesus ends this with the first will be last and the last first, as the norms which keep the powerful in place and the poor poor. Where do you see the powerful keeping the poor poor? I think that's an interesting question, and so it might be easier for me to, to see it from an aerial view rather than a more myopic view of, of what I might personally be doing. But from an aerial view, we can see how legislation is often passed that keeps the poor poor. We can see how tenants um, are paying so much more for housing, which means the owners, yes, they may have had some increase, but are getting rich, richer. There's all different kinds of ways that we can see how the poor are being kept poor. Which among Jesus' teachings do you find especially challenging to hear and eagerly follow? I think it's always challenging to hear how we hold on to our possessions, right? That our possessions are to be let go of. Um, we're to be generous at heart. How do you see yourself in this passage? Which character do you identify with the most? 
the rich man or the disciples. I think at times I identify with both. I identify with the rich man knowing that I have a lot of a lot of possessions and things that I might have a hard time parting with. Um, but I also see myself in the disciples as well. Have you ever thought about yourself as rich? You know, we like to dodge that question. Are we rich? And when we look to facts around the world, anyone who makes $40,000 a year or more is wealthier, is in the top 10% of wealth in this world. Isn't that amazing? $40,000 a year is a lot of money. But in our in our world, in our American way, we would say $40,000 a year is nothing. Because we know about the rich. We know that there's millionaires and there's billionaires in our country. How can I even be rich? And so I think we need to look at rich in, in different ways, right? Um, rich in giving for instance and having compassion for the poor doesn't matter how much money you make a year you can have compassion for the poor um and many you know i think the point that jesus was trying to make is that oftentimes our wealth blinds us from even seeing others well i hope that this uh, lesson gives you something to think about and um if someone were to say to you are you rich your first answer would probably be no but then we are rich in so many ways, not only in monetary ways or land wealth or whatever wealth there out there there might be, but there's other riches, right? There's riches that the disciples had in following Jesus. There's riches that we have in following Jesus as well. Those are the kind of riches that God um, wants us to uh, think about, the riches of compassion and helping other people and seeing others. Have a blessed week, and I look forward to seeing you in church.